Thank you folks for choosing to attend our sexually transmitted infection information uh, talk today and COVID-19 update. I'm Emily Risk, one of the three nurses working at Skyline College Health and Wellness Center Clinic, and I'm joined today with Ronick, one of our fantastic office assistants who makes these events possible. Thanks, Ronick. And Leah, who is also one of our nurse practitioners working in the health center, joined. And giving the talk today is Dr. Walter Chang. He's our amazing medical director at Skyline. He's also an internal medicine physician and infectious disease epidemiologist. In addition to working at Skyline, he also practices as a hospitalist for the Palo Alto Medical Foundation at Stanford. Dr. Walter Chang, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Emily. Uh, well, welcome. And um, you know, I'm, I'm um, really grateful to have the opportunity to talk to you guys about sexually transmitted infections. Um, you know, it's it's a, an issue that's actually becoming more and more prevalent um, in, in the Bay Area in particular. And there's some new developments in sort of STI treatment and prevention that I want to talk about today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and then Emily, if anyone raises their hand with any questions, just just yell out and I'll, I'll, I'll pause because I can't see um, what I'm sharing here, so. Okay, let's... Ronick, you got that? I think you're seeing it on that end. Mm, let's see. Um, but yes. Oops, that's not right. Uh, uh oh, why am I having problems with a share screen here? I did disable already. Uh, I'm sorry. I did disable already. Uh, can you try to share screen again? Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh oh, secure. Oh, I I have to allow. Oh shoot. You know, um, for some reason, my computer security screens, so security settings won't do it. Uh, Ron, uh, can I can I email the 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 um, the um, the slides? Can someone else post it up? For some reason, my computer is blocking me from doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me just do that. Give me a second here. Who could, who should I send it to? Uh, you can send it to me. Okay. Um. Okay, uh, I just went ahead and shared it. Uh, it's a Google Doc, a Google Slide presentation. But if if for some reason I, I can just get started a little bit, and uh, when you are able to pull it up, um, I can, um, you know, I can I can kind of go through this because a lot of this is just um, very basic in the beginning. So um, basically, today I'm going to be talking about sexually transmitted infections. And obviously, um, as the name implies, these are you know, infections and illnesses that are transmitted through sexual contact. And the list of sexually transmitted infections is extremely long. And I, I, I'm not going to go through every single one, but I'm going, going to go through um, the most common uh, ones out there. And I think the best way to think about sexually transmitted infections is that there's sort of two categories. There's one category, which are viral-based STIs and bacterially-based STIs. And the reason I like to put them in two buckets is you can kind of think of them from two different approaches. So in general, viral STIs um, are diseases that generally cannot be cured, uh, but have really good prevention mechanisms, uh, whereas bacterial STIs have some prevention mechanisms, but are curable. So, um, so bacterial STI is curable, viral STI is not curable. Um, that's kind of a framework to think about. And then, um, oh. Did you get, were you able to get, oh, there you go. Thank can you see him? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, if you can go down to the next slide here. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think you can click on. Um, How do I change the presentation of it? Oh yeah, if you go on, on the top right, there should be a thing that says slideshow. Um, top right. Oh, I'm not sure if you can see that there. I cannot do that. Okay, I'm not sure. Oh, if people can yeah, see it's this. Not... Oh, oh, there. A uh, slideshow. Yeah. It's still working, I think. Oh, okay. I think it's, uh, there we go. My internet, mm. I think, is just a little slow over here. No worries. Thank you so much, though. All right. Okay. Okay. You can go down to the next slide here. This one? Um, yeah. Yep. So I, I think I talked okay. about that. I think we can go to the next slide. Again, viral versus not. 
Um, okay. And so here's a list of things I'm going to talk about. It's a kind of a long list, but I, again, separated um, the viral and the bacterial STIs out. So the viral ones that we'll talk about are HIV, um, which is human immunodeficiency virus, HPV, which is human papillomavirus, HSV, which is herpes simplex virus, HAV, HBC, BV, and HCV, which are hepatitis A, B, and C virus. A lot of H's there. Um, and then the bacterial uh, four that I'll talk about are chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and trichomonas. Again, there are more out there, but these account for the very, very large majority of STIs. Um, go ahead and next slide. So I want to talk about sort of general overview of you know prevention um, mechanisms or, or ways to help lower your risk of contracting an STI. And so, you know, the one mainstay, which has been around for a very, very long time, uh, are condom use. And so for if you are engaging in vaginal or anal sex, um, you know, the use of condoms greatly, greatly reduces your risk of STIs, you know, along with pregnancy prevention and um, the, um, and, and others. Um, also getting routine for, for, uh, for persons with uterus, uh, with a uterus, then routine pap smears or routine gynecologic examinations are also really helpful. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And I'll talk about all these a little bit more. The, a couple of things that are kind of emerging uh, over the last uh, about five to seven years, there's been specifically something called pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, which are medications that one can take to greatly lower their risk of contracting HIV. There's also a new thing that just came on this year uh, called post-exposure prophylaxis called DoxyPet, specifically to, to help lower your risk of contracting chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And this is actually quite controversial, and we'll also talk about this. Good news, too, is that a number of these um, infections can be vaccinated against. Um, so there um, are vaccines against human papillomavirus, hepatitis A, and hepatitis B. Uh, and then the other thing that's also really important about prevention, and people don't think about this all the time, is res regular STI testing. So if you're sexually active, and particularly if you're having multiple sexual partners, um, then having regular STI uh, testing is a me mean means of prevention, because if you can test and, and, and diagnose an STI early and get that treated, then obviously there's less um, sort of propagation of that, uh, of that illness. And it's also important that if you test positive to have open discussions with your sexual partners, and hopefully your sexual partners can have open discussions with you. And I really want to stress that, you know, STIs often come with a lot of stigma uh, and a lot of moral judgment. And I really want to try to debunk that. You know, I tell people that um, contracting a cold or a flu, we never put moral judgment on that. Yet for some reason, you know, people don't recognize that actually intimate contact is a major root of contracting a common cold. Um, so, you know, you can you can definitely catch a cold through a sexually encounter, sexual encounter by, you know, kissing someone. We never make a moral judgment about that. And similarly, you know, I, I want to stress that, you know, having sexual activity is a normal part of human existence, and we should not be ashamed about getting tested and having this. And certainly we as providers here uh, at Skyline College, um, um, you know, want to stress that. So um, hopefully having these open discussions also helps to prevent uh, these um, illnesses from, from propagating because if you, let's say, test positive and you talk to your partners and hopefully they get tested and treated, then you really slow down the propagation of this. And what we're seeing in the Bay Area right now is really kind of an explosion of STIs right now, of all STIs. And so there's a big push to try to get um, the number of infections under control. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go through each one of these. Um, I, I know it's a bit of a whirlwind, but I'm glad this is being recorded. So you can always feel, feel free to go back and reference this. So we'll talk about HIV. So HIV, uh, it's a virus uh, that causes a um, condition called AIDS, which is acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And HIV uh, works by attacking certain cells in your immune system. They're called CD4 T cells um, that basically start to gradually weaken your body's ability to fight off infections. Um, and ultimately, uh, without treatment, it is a fatal disease. It is um, um, uh, seen uh, more commonly in men who have sex with men and injection drug users, and there's a, a higher incidence in communities of color, particularly the black and brown community, 
Um, although, you know, incidence, um, uh, everyone is at risk for HIV. Uh, and so um, the highest risk activity uh, to contract HIV is through condomless uh, receptive anal intercourse and injection drug use. Although, again, any sexual contact potentially puts you at risk for HIV. Um, um, next slide. So how do you prevent HIV? So uh, condoms uh, are highly effective. And, um, you know, so this includes, you know, uh, insertive vaginal and insertive anal sex is where it's recommended. Um, there used to be recommendations for using condoms for oral sex, but I think the risk is extremely low. And so, you know, I think if uh, one were to counsel about that, that's really kind of a bit of a judgment call on that. I think another thing that people don't realize that HIV in HIV prevention is that regular testing uh, is a form of prevention, I think, as I alluded to earlier. And so you should get tested for HIV if you fit um, any of these categories. So we also we believe that anyone who's been sexually active at any point in their lives should at least have a single test of HIV for HIV. But you should have regular testing. If you engage in sexual activity with a man who's cis or trans who has sex with men, uh, if you use injection drugs, if you have multiple sexual partners, or you're in a relationship with someone who is HIV positive, in a sexual relationship. And generally, the recommendation is to test yourself um, uh, every three months. Um, and um, the that that's actually the reason we call that prevention is that if we can um, detect HIV infections early, um, and we get people on treatment early, that actually reduces their risk of transmitting to other people. Um, the big news uh, that you may have heard of over the last few years is this concept of PrEP, so it stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And so essentially uh, what this is, is that people take um, medications that are used to treat HIV. Now, when you treat HIV, you usually have to use a cocktail of at least three medications. They can be combined together. Now, we know that if you actually use one or two of these, you can actually prevent infection from occurring. And so that can be done in two different ways now. So you can either take an oral daily pill. There's two drugs on the market. One is called Truvada and the other one is called Descovy. Or you can take an intr uh, intramuscular injection once every two months with a drug called Apertude. And both of these have shown in studies to reduce the risk of contracting HIV up to 100%. Now, in real life, um, that isn't quite as high because not everyone takes their pills every single day or people forget their injections. But, you know, if you're taking this regularly and you're in this high risk category, so, you know, as I mentioned, this the, if you're in this um, group that would, we would recommend regular testing, you'd also be a good candidate for something like PrEP because it's it so greatly reduces your risk of contracting HIV. Um, next slide. And so the thing about HIV treatment, I'll be really brief about that because, um, you know, HIV, which caused AIDS, used to be a death sentence. But in the mid-1990s, a series of medications started to come out that allowed for long-term suppression of the virus. And HIV, unfortunately, is still not curable. But nowadays, we have so many choices for HIV treatment that are really... Um, fortunately, quite easy to take. Um, most uh, regimens now just involve one pill once a day. And the side effects of these medications are so much better than they were even 10 years ago. Uh, and so people with HIV, fortunately, can now live full, uh, completely productive lives. And it's so it's so important to test uh, for HIV early, early because the earlier you start treatment, the less problems you have with the virus. And as I mentioned before, treatment is a form of prevention. And I really want to stress this. This was a, there was a, um, a study that came out a couple of years ago that showed that if a person was HIV positive and they were on treatment and with treatment, you suppress your viral load down and the goal is to get an undetectable viral load in your blood. And most people who are adherent to treatment can maintain that. And I want to stress that if you have an undetectable viral load, you cannot transmit the infection to other people. And so, um, so... As a result, trying to get people identified who are HIV positive and getting them on adequate treatment not only helps them, but also helps prevent the, the virus from being propagated. And it's very exciting news. You know, um, in San Francisco, uh, I think at its peak, 
uh, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, there were over three to 4,000 new HIV infections every year. And because things like PrEP and early detection and treatment are kind of a mainstay in San Francisco, uh, I think there have like been fewer than 70 cases a year now. And there was a report that just came out of Sydney, Australia, that essentially um, within the um, uh, sort of gay male community there, uh, HIV transmission last year was almost zero. So they've actually gotten it down to almost zero, which is pretty incredible. Um, okay, any questions about this? Okay, next virus. Uh, we'll talk about HPV. <laughs> That's human papillomavirus. This is a, is a funky virus because there are actually over 150 types of HPV. So if you've ever had a foot wart or a hand wart, uh, those are human papillomaviruses. Now, of those, a couple of dozen are, are specific to the genital region. So they call, you know, they, they cause genital HPV. And so the foot wart that you have doesn't cause genital HPV. And so, so all these different viruses, uh, HPV subtypes go to different parts of your body. And it's caused by skin to skin contact. And HPV is the cause of genital warts, which is in general, just a cosmetic thing. Uh, it doesn't look great. Um, they usually go away on their own after a year or so. Um, if you, you can, there are certain medical treatments to, to get rid of them if you really want to. Um, but the major concern about HPV that I want to talk about is that certain strains of, of genital HPV can cause cancers. And the main cancer that is um, described with HPV is cervical cancer um, for persons with a uterus, or actually persons with a cervix. Um, so if you have a cervix, you're at risk for cervical cancer if you contract certain types of HPV. Um, and also it can cause anal and throat cancers for people that engage in receptive anal or oral sex as well, although the risk of that is lower. Um, and so, you know, I, I, if I can tell a, a sort of a unique story. So uh, as uh, you, uh, Emily alluded to, I was, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist too. And uh, when I was uh, in graduate school, we had a really interesting uh, sort of history of epidemiology lecture. And actually, a, um, uh, cervical cancer was a really interesting phenomenon where there was some doctor in the 18th cent uh, 19th century, and I can't remember his name, but um, he basically made this observation that um, sex workers had a really high rate of cervical cancer, but nuns never got cervical cancer. And, uh, and he posited there must be something in sexual activity that caused cervical cancer. But back then, there was no way to identify viruses so that no one knew. And so that kind of sat sort of like in the dustbin for like a hundred years before someone actually put this, um, put two and two together and realized there was a specific virus that caused cervical cancer. And actually more than 95% of all cervical cancers are caused by this virus. So that was just a quick historical aside. Um, next slide. So how do you prevent HPV? I, I think the key thing is that um, uh, HPV and, and and its risk of causing cervical cancer is concerning. However, with routine screening, the risk of either getting cervical cancer or dying of cervical cancer is greatly, greatly reduced. And so the way to do this for, for uh, people with a, with a cervix is to do pap smears and routine gynecologic examinations. Um, and so the guidelines are basically this. It, you should start getting a routine gynecologic exam uh, for cervical cancer screening at age 21, regardless of your sexual history. Uh, because we also know that um, even if you don't engage in, in insertive vaginal sex, that sometimes even with skin to skin contact, um, there can be transmission into the cervix. Um, and so um, you don't have to report that you've had insertive vaginal sex in, uh, to get a pap smear and you should get one at the age of 21 and do that every three years. And after the age of 30, I won't go over all this, but there's kind of different guidelines of how to get tested. Um, um, and basically what the pap smear is, just so you guys know, is that, um, you would do a gynecologic exam and um, a speculum would be inserted into the vagina and then a swab is put into the cervix and a little sample, uh, it's um, the um, swab is sort of um, uh, just um, collects some cells from the cervix. It's There's no cut, it's not uh, particularly invasive. Um, and essentially those cells are put onto a slide and they look to see if there are any changes to those cells um, because HPV can cause some cancerous changes. And uh, the pap smear allows um, providers to look for any of those early signs that something might be moving towards cancer. Um, and so uh, getting it every three years can really help to, or to have early detection of something that might not be going right. 
Now, the great thing about HPV now is that there is a there's a, a vaccination available called, called Gardasil 9. And what Gardasil 9 is, it picks nine of the types of HPV that are most likely to cause cancer. And what's really cool is that if you get the vaccination, um, you, you really dramatically reduce your risk of getting cervical cancer. And the recommendation is to have the vaccination before, you're, uh, before you begin sexual activity, which is ages 11 or 12. I will admit there's a lot of sort of social issues about this. And there have been a lot of parents that don't want their children to get this because, um, you know, there's a lot of stigma again around sexual activity. And I really stress to people and to parents that I've talked to that having the vaccine doesn't encourage their children to have sex. And it's one of those things where the assumption is at some point in their lives, they'll be sexually active. And this will this has a dramatic effect on lowering um, a person's risk of developing cervical cancer. And boys should also be vaccinated too, because they are at risk for um, oral and anal cancers as well, and at risk for transmitting um, HPV to female sexual partners if they have sort of, um, um, you know, male to female sex. Um, now, if you did not get a vaccine at the age of 11 or 12, uh, it's not too late. And so the guidelines say that you can actually, you should get the vaccine up to age 26. And then after age 26, from age 27 to 45, you can consider getting it. It's a little less effective at that point um, uh, because many people have already contracted um, HPV strains by that point. Um, but you can discuss with your provider, particularly if you are having, again, multiple sex partners and, you know, um, and could be at higher risk for um, acquiring this um, infection. Next slide. Uh, treatment. Um, Unfortunately, there's there's really no effective medical therapy. So I think if your pap if, if if you're a person with the cervix and your pap smear shows that there's some changes in the cells of the cervix that look precancerous, um, there's some some observation screening uh, uh, strategies and certain surgical procedures that are done to remove the altered tissue. Um, I'm not going to go into the specifics of that, but again, the goal is to really try to look for um, early signs of precancer before it becomes a full cancer. Um, that's that. Okay, next. So the next virus is I'm gonna go through a little bit faster here. This um, HSV, which is herpes simplex virus. Um, uh, this is caused, also caused by skin to skin contact. Um, there's two types of HSV. There's HSV one and two. Um, um, HSV one typically causes oral um, cold sores. Most of us have it. Um, and then HSV two tends to cause genital herpes. And when you get HSV, um, the infection usually results in a, in a cluster of these painful vesicles, which are these very small blisters that eventually pop and they crest and they heal over. Um, the, the challenge with HIV, the, the good news about HSV is that in and of itself, it is not like a, it's not a life-threatening disease. It doesn't cause cancer like HPV. It doesn't kill you like HIV. But once you get HSV, you can't get rid of it. And so the infection is lifelong. And what happens is it flares, it kind of goes into dormancy and then it flares again and it goes into dormancy back and forth. And the, the key thing about HSV is that how often someone flares is really unpredictable. So some people can get HSV and like never have a flare or have a flare every 10 years. And then other people get flares every month. Um, and each time you flare, it takes about seven to 10 days for things to get better. The only thing I just want to say about life-threatening disease is that if you are um, pregnant, um, it is really important that you get screened for active herpes at labor. I think every gynecologist um, should should know this because um, if you have this and you can trans transmit it to the infant and cause serious illness for that infant, um, but um, I, I, I think I don't I can't imagine why any gynecologist wouldn't look for that. So just, just so, but just so you know, um, and if you know that you've had a history of herpes simplex virus or HSV and you're pregnant, you should let your gynecologist, uh, your obstetrician, excuse me, know about this um, so they can be aware. Um, next slide. Um, how to prevent uh, HSV. Uh, I wrote condoms. It can be helpful, but because it's skin to skin contact, um, uh, you know, obviously there are areas that might not be covered by the condom that could be could be transmitting. Um, I think the best thing to do is that you're uh, shedding a lot of virus when you're having a recurrence or a flare. And so you should avoid sexual contact during the episode of the rash. 
just so you know, if you start on, there are certain antiviral medications that can be used for HSV. And again, this doesn't cure HSV, but it can reduce and shorten the duration of symptoms. And so if you can shorten the duration of symptoms, you can also, it's a good preventive mechanism because you also reduce the time that you're shedding the virus. And so you can pass it to people less, um, less in a less likely way. And just so you know, in terms of um, also prevention for yourself sort of medically, is that if you're having frequent recurrences, you can be put on daily suppressive antiviral therapy. So you take a daily pill to help reduce the risk of recurrences. And I've had patients who were getting, you know, 10 recurrences a year and with this medication get like one every three years. So it can have a, a, a really dramatic effect. And th this, unfortunately, these vesicles can be really quite painful and very itchy. And so it can really impact people's quality of lives. So if, if you do have HSV and are having a lot of recurrences, you know, please come talk to us because there are strategies to get this to not happen as much. Okay, next slide. And now I'll talk about the hepatitis viruses. So it's HAV um, or, or hepatitis A virus. This is transmitted through a fecal oral route. Actually, the most common way of getting HAV is to um, eat contaminated food. Um, this is why you see in your bath in the, all the bathrooms of every restaurant, it tells all the workers they have to wash their hands after they use the bathroom. It's because that's a way to prevent HAV. Um, the good news about HAV is that it doesn't cause any chronic illness. It only causes acute illness. But the danger is that in about 1% of cases, it can be fatal and it causes acute liver failure. Now, if you've had hepatitis A in the past, you are immune for life. But if you haven't been infected, you should get tested for it. I, every single person who has not had documented a hepatitis A vax, uh, uh, infection or hasn't been vaccinated should be vaccinated because once you're vaccinated, you get lifelong protection. Um, that's that. Next, uh, HBV. Uh, so hepatitis B virus, um, that's actually transmitted through blood. Again, you know, when, when one has sex, there's a lot of sort of like you can transmit through all, all sorts of ways through skin to skin contact. There can be blood exchange. There can be saliva exchange. So all of these are transmissible in different ways. Hepatitis B is a complicated disease. Um, they're not going to go into the specifics of it, but it can cause both acute and chronic illness. And the major issue with hepatitis B is that if you become a chronic carrier of HBV, it can cause cirrhosis, which is end stage liver failure. Um, oh, and sorry, missed typo there and liver cancer. And again, hepatitis B is preventable with vaccination. You know, for all people who were born after about 1982 or 83, um, they should have been vaccinated against hepatitis B. Uh, there's a World Health Organization directive to do that. Um, we can also test to see if you have immunity. Um, um, but again, if you're sexually active, it's highly recommended that you, you're vaccinated. Uh, next. And the last virus I'm going to talk about is hepatitis C. Um, and so this is also transmitted by blood. It's not considered as sexually transmissible as some of the other diseases that way, but we are seeing higher, higher, higher and higher rates in men who have sex with men. Uh, and it's a very highly um, uh, transmissible through injection drug use. I know we're talking about STIs, but just to mention that. And like hepatitis B, it can cause cirrhosis or end stage liver failure and liver cancer. With hepatitis C, there's no vaccination, but the big emerging thing is that in the past, there were these really horrible treatments for hepatitis, hepatitis C that made you super sick uh, to try to cure the, the virus, and it had like a 40% success rate. It was just miserable. But now we actually have really good cures, so we can actually cure hepatitis C more than 90% of the time uh, through a short course that's actually quite tolerated, So, but it's really expensive. Um, most insurance companies will cover it, but um, it's a little challenging sometimes to get the medication. Um, you, if you're sexually active, the recommendation is, sh is that you should be tested for hepatitis C uh, once. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to move on to bacterial um, 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 STIs now. Um, so I'm going to group chlamydia and gonorrhea together. So they're two different uh, bacteria that cause STIs, but they actually behave really similarly. And so I, I thought it'd be easier if I grouped them together. And um, so what are the symptoms of chlamydia and gonorrhea? So typically you have pain or burning with urination, and you might see discharge from the urethra. If you've had receptive uh, anal intercourse, you can also have rectal pain or discharge, or sometimes the feeling that after you go and have a bowel movement that like you don't feel like it's complete. Um, if you have um, um, have had you know oral sex, you can develop a sore throat. Um, um, also, if there's any sort of um, secretions that get into the eye, you can actually get um, you know um, 
ocular, chlamydia, and gonorrhea, and you get discharged from there as well. And then people with a uterus, um, pelvic pain uh, is really common as well. And so if you have any of these symptoms and you, you're sexually active, you definitely should come in and get tested. Uh, next slide. So I, th I think the king I, I want to stress about chlamydia and gonorrhea is that in and of itself, it's not the most serious illness, but if it's not left treated, it poses a, a, a problem for people who have a uterus. And so what it can do is that um, for people who have a cervix and uterus, if the cervix gets infected, that infection can start to go upwards into the uterus uh, and, and then into the fallopian tubes. And this is a condition called pelvic inflammatory disease. And this can cause a lot of scarring in that area that can lead to permanent infertility. And so I, it's very important that if you have any of these symptoms to get tested uh, because you don't want the infection to kind of get worse. Now, not every single person who gets this uh, will develop uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, however, it's definitely a, a risk. My dog is growling there. Um, next slide. So how do you prevent uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea? Oh, condoms. Condoms are highly protective. Um, you also want to get tested. Um, and so we recommend for sexually active individuals testing annually. But if you're having multiple sexual partners, you probably should get tested every three months. And then, as I mentioned before, you should let your partners know if you test positive. Now, there's a new thing that is um, being discussed in the medical community now, which is called something called post-exposure prophylaxis with an antibiotic called doxycycline, and it's called doxypep. And essentially what it is, is you take a single 200 milligram dose of doxycycline immediately after, but no more than 72 hours after condomless sexual encounters. So if you've had a sexual encounter that was insertive uh, and it was condomless, um, taking this medication can reduce your risk of getting chlamydia, gonorrhea, and actually a, a, um, an illness called syphilis, which I'll talk about in a second, um, by about two thirds. There are a lot of controversies about this because the concern has been that particularly with chlamydia and gonorrhea, these two illnesses have begun to develop quite a bit of antibiotic resistance. And the thought is, you know, if you take this medication, sure, it reduces your risk by of getting this disease by two thirds, but are you going to be encouraging further resistance development by antibiotics? And because this is so new, we really don't know if um, this is a good long-term strategy or not. Now, there's some people who counter by saying, look, if we don't lower the rates of the of chlamydia and gonorrhea, and I'll say that, you know, um, in general, a lot, I mean, chlamydia and gonorrhea are really, really common. I think uh, amongst um, people under the age of 30, the risk of getting chlamydia is about um, five to 6% per year. So one out of every 20 people get chlamydia every single year. And so the thought is that, you know, if you um, give people this doxypep, and you lower the rates of actual infection, well, then you're using antibiotics less to treat these infections. And so maybe that actually will reduce the amount of antibiotic resistance in the future. I, I, th that makes sense to people. So there's a lot of debate in the community. I, we definitely know in the short term that using something like doxypep in, can help you reduce the risk of contracting chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis if you don't use a condom during sex. Um, but whether this is a good long-term solution is still up for debate. Um, however, if this is something you're interested in, you can certainly come and talk to us and we can counsel you a little bit more about that. Now, I just do want to let you know that it is not unlike PrEP for HIV, doxypep is not a surefire way of preventing these illnesses. So if you're having again, multiple sexual partners and they're condomless, even if you're using doxypep, you should be tested still in that same testing um, model that I mentioned above because it's not a foolproof um, prophylactic mechanism. Next slide. So how do you diagnose and treat? Um, so for the persons with the uterus, um, um, usually tested with vaginal swamps or cervical swamps during a during gynecologic examination. You can also use a urine test, although that's not always as sensitive, but it's easier to do. Um, for persons with a penis, uh, urine collection is the way to go. Uh, for if you engage in receptive anal sex or um, oral sex, then rectal and throat swabs are also recommended. Both can be treated with antibiotics. Um, you can see 
Um, the, I won't go over the, the, the treatment options below. I mean, your provider can tell you that. So um, fortunately, they're, they're highly curable with antibiotics, although resistance is an issue. Uh, next slide. Syphilis. Um, so syphilis is a very fascinating illness. Um, it's been described even back to like Greek, ancient Greek times. Um, and um, just as an aside, I, this is actually my area of research when I was in medical school. It's a fascinating disease because um, it comes in three phases. And the primary phase occurs in the first two weeks of exposure. And you develop this painless ulcer at the site of infection and it's through skin to skin contact. And because it's painless, unless it's obviously visible, um, you know, um, many people don't know that they've contracted syphilis. So as an example, if you have a penis and the ulcers on the underside of your penis or on your scrotum, you don't look there, you wouldn't know. Or if it's like on the labia and you're not looking, you wouldn't know because it doesn't hurt, unlike herpes simplex virus, which hurts a lot. And so what happens then, it, it kind of quiets down, it heals up. And then about, a, about a, a few weeks later, then you get this like generalized rash. And what's kind of cool, not, not cool, but what's really unique about syphilis is that it's one of only four or five rashes that involve the palms or the soles of the feet. And so if you develop a, so the rash is much more noticeable. And usually when people get, get the rash, they also feel kind of sick. They can get a low grade fever. They just feel kind of flu-like. But I, I really want to tell you that, you know, you may not see the, so if you see an ulcer anywhere that you might've had sexual encounters with and it's painless, that should be a clue. Hey, I should get tested for syphilis. But if you don't see it, the next stage is if you get this rash and the rashes involve your palms and your soles, you should think about syphilis and get tested. Now, if that you still don't get tested, then it goes quiets down later. And there's this thing called tertiary syphilis, which can reemerge at any point, six months later, 40 years later. Um, and it's called the great mimicker. And the joke in medical school when I was there is that um, oftentimes, you know, uh, our professors would ask us, well, you know, this person has these symptoms. What could this be? And you start listing off diseases. And when you start running out of ideas, you just always say syphilis because that's always right. Um, because I've seen syphilis present as a brain tumor, syphilis present as a heart attack, um, syphilis present as diarrhea, um, syphilis presenting as psychosis. Um, and if anyone wants to talk more about that, I'm happy to talk about it. It's it's a really fascinating disease. Um, and in what we're seeing in syphilis right now is a really dramatic rise in, in the MSM or men who have sex with men population, but also in um, sort of the general um, population as well. And, uh, so sorry for that soapbox there. If you can go on to the next slide. Uh, prevention. So condoms are highly protect uh, are, are really good against protecting against syphilis and again regular testing and this is done through blood work and the um and it's again like gonorrhea and chlamydia um highly treatable with antibiotics and i think the reason why syphilis kind of evades us a lot is the fact that it's really not very symptomatic and uh, initially uh so a lot of people get that first or second phase and actually don't seek medical attention whereas with chlamydia and gonorrhea you know you tend to have such painful urethral discharge that you know you, you want to see a doctor about that or hsv which is really painful you see a doctor about that um but with syphilis it can lie really low but i do recommend that people who are sexually active get routine syphilis testing because that tertiary syphilis is what we're really nervous about because that uh, that can really cause significant problems later in life. So if you're sexually active, getting an annual syphilis test is um, highly recommended um, and it's cu highly curable with antibiotics. Uh, and then I think the last one I was going to talk about, uh, the next slide is trichomonas. So trichomonas is um, a parasite um, that causes symptoms somewhat similar to chlamydia and gonorrhea, usually um, more mild. And the hallmark of this is for, uh, for um, uh, persons with a, uh, with a vagina, uh, it can cause a very foul smelling vaginal discharge, which can, which can be a clue. Um, in and of itself, the disease doesn't pose a huge clinical risk, um, but the major risk is for someone who's pregnant or would like to get pregnant because if you're carrying trichomonas, you do have an increased risk of miscarriage. Um, and so uh, the testing is done through vaginal swabs or through urine tests. And you, it's again, highly um, curable with antibiotics. And so I think that was a whirlwind tour of STIs and, um, and uh, viral and bacterial. And again, I wanna kind of, um, Heart, uh, kind of pull back a bit and say here that for all of the, the um, 
viruses and bacteria that cause STIs. As I mentioned, the bacterial ones are really highly curable and the viral ones aren't. But I also want to let people know that there are lots of strategies to prevent you from getting these. And if you do get them, it's it's never the end of the world because we have a lot of treatment options for both of these categories. Um, and so, um, and but certainly if you have questions or you have symptoms that are concerning, you know, this is why we're here. And I think I have the last slide uh, coming just for some resources. So some local resources I was identifying. So obviously at the San Mateo Community College uh, Network here at our health clinics, we can provide a lot of the counseling and testing and treatment. I, I will say that uh, as a caveat, um, there, the Medi-Cal system, which is the um, uh, which is one of the federal insurance systems, they have a, a program called Family Pact, of which um, uh, the College of San Mateo and Kenyatta College have that designation, and as a result, can provide uh, free uh, testing and counseling for STIs. Unfortunately, Skyline College does not have that, so unfortunately, there is some cost associated with testing. Uh, however, certainly, you know, all the counseling we can do at all those sites. Um, if you all don't want to come to one of our clinics within San Mateo County, I couldn't actually find any uh, designated free STI testing and counseling centers, but the Edison STI clinic in San Mateo, which is near San Mateo Medical Center, offers low cost STI testing and counseling. I believe it's $25 uh, and you can go on their website and look for that. And I know that in San Francisco, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation offers free STI testing and counseling, so you can feel free to go there as well. So with that, I'll kind of conclude my talk. I think we have, um, you know, a little bit of time. And so I just wanted to um, uh, see if anyone has any questions they want to ask. Hi, Walter. Uh, thanks for your talk. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm, I'm one of the nurses at Skyline and at CSM. Um, sometimes I have uh, students ask um, just because of the cost, like, which um, STI testing should they really just focus on? Because um, mm -hmm. I, I usually just recommend like about four. Um, again, just, you know, thinking of cost. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. So I think if you're sexually active, um, again, with multiple sexual partners, it really is recommended that you get tested frequently. You know, I, I would say, you know, the recommendation is every three months. Now, that's assuming you're having multiple sexual partners sort of frequently. Um, in that case, typically what we recommend is chlamydia and gonorrhea testing, certainly every three months, and HIV testing. Syphilis testing can kind of be extended more to like once a year um, if, you, if, you, if, if cost is an issue. And certainly if you're having, you know, it's a bit of a judgment call. So if you're having a monogamous partner, um, uh, then less frequent testing is appropriate, like once every year or two is appropriate. Certainly as with HPV screening for people with a uterus, that's every three years. So it's not as frequent there. Um, and if you're having multiple sexual partners, but they're quite infrequent, then the, the spacing can be put out a little bit more. But I think the most important thing is to really try to, chlamydia and gonorrhea are by far the most common. Uh, and so that would be, if I were to prioritize, that would be the ones I would test for first. Um, and then, you know, HIV would be next after that because early detection and treatment makes such a huge sort of long-term um, uh, difference. Um, and, and then, you know, syphilis, we're trying to test more frequently in the community only because we're trying to like reduce the rise. But from a clinical perspective, you know, if you went, you know, six months or a year without testing, it's not the worst clinical thing in the world. And this is completely off the books, just so you know, it's not, this is, I'm not, quite going by guidelines, but obviously there is guidelines and there's reality, right? So is that helpful? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, do they still have the point of care testing for like the, I think chlamydia and gonorrhea? Was there like one that, that you, I, I was hearing like you can go to the pharmacy, there was some sort of kit. Um, well, I don't think for gonorrhea and chlamydia, I know there's rapid HIV testing. Um, you know, I think in the in the clinic setting, we generally don't like to do point of care testing because the sensitivity of the of the tests are not quite as good. Certainly for HIV, um, uh, point of care testing is not quite as sensitive. Uh, and so, you know, traditional lab testing, 
picks up a little bit more and that'd be preferable in the clinic. I'm not sure about, I actually don't, I don't know about gonorrhea and chlamydia point of care testing. I only know about HIV. Okay, it's an or that or a shore, the oral swap that you can do. You can mm -hmm. buy it buy it at Walgreens if you want. Although it's kind of pricey. It's like 40 something dollars, I think. Walter, how mm -hmm. often does syphilis go to the tertiary stage? Because is that a you, pretty common thing that happens? Not anymore, thank goodness. Um it used to be quite common. Um and um, you know. Um, I think that there are certainly people who slip through the cracks and that, that happens. Generally speaking, um, syphilis is the least common of the bacterial STIs. Um, but how can I put it? Um, it's not that common, but we are starting to, so it used to be quite common back in like the 19th century when there was no treatment or no antibiotics. And then obviously with antibiotics. So the reason why tertiary syphilis, if I can be honest, why it doesn't happen is that syphilis is really curable. It's one of the only like three bugs out there where penicillin, which is the original antibiotic, still works because it doesn't re develop resistance. So basically any antibiotic generally kills syphilis. And so the reason people don't have tertiary syphilis in reality is that at some point in your life, you get put on antibiotics, right? You get a UTI, you get put on antibiotics, right? You have a pneumonia when you're 60 years old and you get put on antibiotics. And so that treats the pneumonia, but also just cures your syphilis at the same time. So I think it's because of that, we're not seeing a lot of tertiary syphilis, thank goodness, but it doesn't guarantee that you're, you know, it, it doesn't guarantee the cure. And I think the danger is that when you, syphilis stays in your system for years and years and years, it can attack any organ system of the body and cause, it can really cause all sorts of, it can really cause the body to go haywire. Is actually something called a general paresis of the insane. And so anytime someone com uh, comes in with psych a new psychosis, we always test for syphilis because once in a blue moon, we actually, the syphilis can attack the brain and cause people to become psychotic, which is fascinating when wow. you see it. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to just review the fact that people can get vaccinated and where you can get vaccinated and mm. that health, people with health insurance, these vaccines are covered underneath your health insurance. And if they if you don't have health insurance or if you're under vax or underinsured, so your insurance doesn't cover um, vaccines, which most do, um, you can go to uh, a pharmacy or you can come to a clinic or San Mateo mobile clinic. San Mateo County has a mobile clinic where you can get these vaccines too. And you can see if you qualify for the free vaccines for these things. So, and yeah. if you do have insurance, I really recommend that people go to a pharmacy, a Walgreens, a Safeway, whatever's convenient for you, and you can get your vaccines there. Medi-Cal is considered a insurance, so that will be covered. Um, so the HPV, um, hepatitis B vaccine, hepatitis A vaccine, and the HPV are all covered underneath that. So you don't have to worry as long as well as COVID and the flu is all covered under that as well. Right. This is a plug right now, as many people know, there's a new formulation of the COVID vaccine that just came out last week. And I highly recommend people get that along with their flu vaccines. I think last year we saw this kind of wave of COVID flu and RSV and it's got the triple demic, is that what they called it? Um, and we're kind of a little worried that might happen again this year. So if, um, if you have the opportunity to go get that, please do. And just so you know, um, if you're not insured, um, unfortunately, the federal emergency pandemic um, response uh, isn't covering COVID vaccines anymore. But I know there's a network of, of um, providers that are going to be doing free COVID vaccines for people who are uninsured. I don't have the full information on that yet, but I can certainly forward it to people once I get all the, the, all the info. Great. We just heard from the county about that too, and they haven't figured out all their information about that. But again, we'll, we will also put that on our website and link to that as well. It's just not totally up and running yet. They haven't figured all their dates out. Yep. Oh, and we uh, will be giving the flu uh, shot at the clinic. We just don't have it yet. And as soon as we do, we will let everybody know that they can get it at our clinics as well. Um. I have a question here um, from Goldie um, who wrote, do you recommend online ordering of home testing kits? Is this for COVID testing kits? Oh, 
Oh, uh, any. Um, well, you know, the in terms of STIs, the, the only um, home testing kit that I know about is the Orishore, which is the oral swab HIV testing kit. Uh, you know, that can be purchased either online or through a you know, through a pharmacy. Obviously, if you're going to order online, I always tell people to order through a reputable source, like, you know, through a pharmacy, uh, you know, um, even Amazon, sometimes I think they have third party sellers that I don't always trust. Um, so I, I tend to tell people to order directly from a pharmacy. Um, certainly you can do that. Um, uh, and certainly for COVID testing kits too, you know, if, if, if you, you can buy that either in person or you can order it online, but Tend, tend to do it directly through a pharmacy. Um, that's just my recommendation. We also Walter, have test uh, kits in the health center. Oh, you do? Walter, okay. I think I think Goldie was referring to some of those testing kits that I was um, asking about for, uh, oh. there are some actually for like chlamydia, uh, oh. trichomonas. Uh, it's just that, like you were mentioning, they're not very sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. So I think um, there's still a lot of research that are um, going into them to make them better. And because they're not sensitive, it's just not recommended. But but there are places that are selling them. Um, ah, and you I see buy them saying. as a home testing kit and then you send in the results. Right. I think the challenge I would say about home testing, a couple things. One, I, I understand the appeal of a home testing kit, because obviously you're doing it in the privacy of your own home. You, you know, I, I know a lot of people um, face the stigma of worrying about STIs and, and don't want to interface, you know, with people about that. But you're absolutely right, Leah. I think one of the challenges is that these home testing kits, I just don't think are as sensitive. And then what do you do if it's positive, right? And then also it's one of those things where I worry sometimes that the way that the collection is done is just not done in, in the correct way, which also reduces its sensitivity. And so I, I do want to stress to people um, that, you know, you can use the home testing kits. I'm not saying you, you sh shouldn't use it, um, but I also want to stress that, you know, we here at Skyline um, are going to treat, you know, all patients with dignity, respect, and confidentiality. Um, so I really want to stress that, you know, there's no judgment in our clinic at all about this. And I think that here we can provide, you know, more full counseling about these issues. We can do the appropriate, the appropriate testing, um, you know, based upon your symptoms um, and things like that. So, um, you know, my recommendation is still to, to, you know, to talk to a provider about this, because I think we can kind of give our sort of richer, fuller uh, sort of assessment of what's going on. Perfect. Walter, do you have anything to say about this new strain of COVID that we're seeing as the dominant strain right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think that, um, well, what can I say about COVID? <laughs> I feel like all of us are tired of it. Um, um, I just got over COVID myself. So the new strain, I think what we're seeing with all the strains, actually what's interesting now is there's not one dominant strain. There's a number of circulating strains right now. And they're all derived from this BA5 strain that came out earlier in the year. And so what's interesting is about the COVID vaccine that Pfizer and Moderna are coming out. So we had the original vaccine. And then if people remember about a year or so ago, a little more than a year ago, they came out with the bivalent vaccine, which was the original uh, vaccine plus one that was kind of targeted to the Omicron variant. So now with this new vaccine, it doesn't contain any of those old two components. It's only against what uh, something called the BA5 variant, which was kind of the dominant strain back about six months ago. And it takes that long to develop the vaccine. Now that BA5 strain is no longer the dominant strain floating around, but all the strains that are existing that are problematic are all sort of um, descended from that strain. And so the vaccine should be pretty highly effective against it. I think, you know, the thing about these strains that have been emerging, fortunately, so far, I mean, they're just like the previous strains, they're really easy to contract. And so, you know, as people's immunity sort of wanes from, um, you know, pre previous infections, we're starting to see this bit of a spike. But I think people are pretty... Um, pretty optimistic the vaccine can help to kind of bend that curve a little bit. Unfortunately, none of the new strains have proven to be more lethal than previous strains, which is kind of also nice to see. 
you know, that said, I think that no one knows what the future is going to hold. We know that new strains will keep on emerging because this, this virus likes to mutate. So we all have to stay really vigilant and to make sure that, you know, we are um, proactive when we see something that might be a little bit more concerning. I think right now we're in this sort of baseline where, you know, it's circulating, people get a little bit sick, but we're not seeing a ton of really bad sickness and illness, but we just have to be vigilant about any, any changes. Awesome. And would you recommend Paxlovid? Or who would you recommend Paxlovid? Yeah, so Paxlovid is a is a is an antiviral medication that can be taken um, to help uh, reduce your risk of serious illness or hospitalization or death. And actually, for high risk groups, um, it can reduce your risk of hospitalization or death by over ninety percent. But that said, you know it is only FDA approved for people with with risk factors for or, or who are high risk for serious illness. And so that generally is people who have underlying respiratory illnesses, people who have diabetes, um, bad high blood pressure, who are, have a weakened immune system, who are elderly. Those people who are otherwise, you know, young or middle aged and healthy, um, there's really no benefit to Paxlovid because your risk of serious illness or death is so low. Um, especially if you're vaccinated. So if you're vaccinated and you're otherwise healthy and sort of under the age of 65 or so, there's really no role for Paxlovid because it really doesn't, your risk of having serious illness is pretty low, you know? But if you have those risk factors that I mentioned, then Paxlovid can be really helpful because you're still at risk for more serious illness and it can be really beneficial. The only challenge with Paxlovid is that it interacts with a lot of other medications. So if you're going to take it, you really do need to you know, talk to a doctor and make sure they know exactly what medications you're on because there need to be some adjustments to, that need to be made. But it's a great drug for people who are at high risk. Um, Does it shorten the duration of it as well? Yes, it can. Okay. It can. Yeah. Uh, what is the name of the current COVID-19 vaccine is a question. Uh, I don't think it has an official name. It's just the sort of new COVID vaccine. Sort of like, a, it's essentially, you can think of this as sort of like a, flu. essentially what the way that COVID-19 vaccines are going to look like, they're going to look exactly like the flu, flu vaccines. So every year they're going to kind of guess how flu and COVID are going to mutate and come up with a new version. So it's just an updated version of the vaccine to try to target what's dominantly circulating. Okay. Hey, well, thanks so much, um, everyone, for spending this hour. Um, I hope uh, this was informative, and I look forward to, we'll come up with some more other topics coming out in the future. Thank you. And this this will be recorded and put on the website, too, if you want to refer patients to it. Thank you, Walter. Thanks, Walter. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.